Now, the last book I read the first chapter of um, actually kind of devolved into some complex cipher work. So we're going to start something different. So today we're going to be looking at a book called Rewards and Fairies by Rudyard Kipling. Um, it appears to be fantasy. So we're going to start with that. This got poetry in it, which is fun. So it starts with a bit called A Charm. Take of English earth as much as either hand may rightly clutch. In the taking of it breathe, prayer for all who lie beneath. Not the great nor well bespoke, but the mere uncounted folk, of, though, of whose life and death is none report or lamentation. Lay that earth upon thy heart, and thy sickness shall depart. It shall sweeten and make whole fevered breath and festered soul. It shall mightily restrain over busy hand and brain. It shall ease thy mortal strife against the immortal woe of life, till thyself restored shall prove by what grace the heavens do move. Take of English flowers these, spring's full-faced primroses, summer's wild, wide-hearted rose, autumn's wallflower of the close, and thy darkness to illume, winter's bee-thronged ivy bloom seek and serve them where they bide from candle moss to christmas tide for these simples used aright shall restore a failing sight these shall cleanse and purify webbed and inward turning eye these shall show thee treasures hid thy familiar fields amid at thy threshold on thy hearth or about thy daily path and reveal which is thy need Every man a king indeed. The next section is entitled Introduction. Once upon a time, Dan and Una, brother and sister, living in the English country, had the good fortune to meet Puck, alias Robin Goodfellow, alias Nico Lincoln, alias Lob Lie by the Fire, the last survivor in England of those whom mortals call fairies. Their proper name, of course, is the People of the Hills. This Puck, by means of the magic of oak, ash, and thorn, gave the children power to see what they should see and hear what they should hear, though it should have happened three thousand a year. The result was from time to time and in different places on the farm and in the fields and in the country about, they saw and talked to some rather interesting people. One of these, for instance, was a knight of the Norman Conquest, another a young centurion of a Roman legion stationed in England, another a builder and decorator of King Henry the seventh, I think that's seventh time, and so on and so forth, as I have tried to explain in a book called Puck of Pook's Hill. A year or so later, the children met Puck once more, and though they were then older and wiser, and wore boots regularly instead of going barefooted when they got the chance, Puck was as kind to them as ever, and introduced them to more people of the old days. He was careful, of course, to take away the memory of their walks and conversations afterwards, but otherwise he did not interfere. And Dan and Una would find the strangest sort of persons in their gardens or woods. In the stories that follow, I am trying to tell something about those people. The next section is entitled Cold Iron. When Dan and Una had arranged to go out before breakfast, they did not remember that it was midsummer morning. They only wanted to see the otter, which old Hobden said had been fishing their brook for weeks, and early morning was a time to surprise him. As they tiptoed out of the house into the wonderful stillness, the church clock struck five. Dan took a few steps across the dew blobbed lawn and looked at his black footprints. I thought we ought to be kind to our poor boots, he said. They'll get horrid wet. It was their first summer in boots, and they hated them. So they took them off and slung them round their necks and paddled joyfully over the dripping turf, where the shadows lay the wrong way, like evening in the east. The sun was well up and warm, but by the brook the last of the night mist still fumed off the water. They picked up the chain of otter's footprints on the mud and followed it from the bank between the weeds and drenched mowing while the birds shouted with surprise 
Then the track left the brook and became a smear, as though a log had been dragged along. They traced it into three cows' meadow, over the mill sluice to the forge, round Hobden's garden, and then up the slope till it ran out on the short turf and fern of Pook's Hill, and they heard the cock pheasants crowing in the woods behind them. No use, said Dan, questing like a puzzled hound. The dews drying off, and old Hobden says otters'll travel for miles. I'm sure we've traveled miles, Una fanned herself with her hat. How still it is. It's going to be a regular roaster. <clears throat> She looked down the valley, where no chimney yet smoked. Hobden's up! Dan pointed to the open door of the forge cottage. What do you suppose he has for breakfast? One of them. He says they eat good all times of the year. Una jerked her head at some stately pheasants going down to the brook for a drink. A few steps further on, a fox almost broke under their bare feet, yapped, and trotted off. Ah, <laughs> Miss Reynolds, Miss Reynolds! Dan was quoting from Old Hobden, If I'd a knowed all you knowed, I'd know something. See the winged hats in Puck of Pook's Hill. I say, Una lowered her voice, you know that funny feeling of things having happened before? I felt it when you said Miss Reynolds. So did I, Dan began. What is it? They faced each other, stammering with excitement. Wait, a shake! I'll remember in a minute. Wasn't it something about a fox last year? Oh, I nearly had it then, Dan cried. Be quiet, said Una, prancing excitedly. There was something happened before we met the fox last year. Hills. Broken hills. The play at the theater. See what you see. I remember now, Dan shouted. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Pook's Hill. Puck's Hill? Puck! I remember too, said Una. And it's midsummer day again. The young fern on a knoll rustled, and Puck walked out, chewing a green-topped rush. Good midsummer morning to you. Here's a happy meeting, said he. They shook hands all around and asked questions. You've wintered well, he said after a while, and looked them up and down. Nothing much wrong with you, seemingly. They've put us into boots, said Una. Look at my feet. They're all pale and white, and my toes are squidged together awfully. Yes, boots make a difference. Puck wiggled his brown, square, hairy foot and cropped a dandelion flower between the big toe and the next. I could do that last year. Dan said dismally as he tried and failed. And the boots simply ruin one's climbing. There must be some advantage to them, I suppose, said Puck, or folk wouldn't wear them. Shall we come this way? They sauntered along, side by side, till they reached the gate at the far end of the hillside. Here they halted just like cattle and let the sun warm their backs while they listened to the flies in the woods. Little Linden's is awake, said Una, as she hung her chin on the top rail. See the chimney smoke? Today's Thursday, isn't it? Puck turned to look at the pink, the old pink farmhouse across the little valley. Mrs. Vincy's baking day. Bread should rise well in this weather. He yawned, and that set them both yawning. The bracken about rustled and ticked and shook in every direction. They felt that little crowds were stealing past. Doesn't that sound like, um, the people of the hills, said Una? It's the birds and wild things drawing up to the woods before people get about, said Puck, as though he were Ridley the keeper. Oh, we know that. I only said it sounded like. As I remember them, the people of the hills used to make more noise. They'd settle down for the day, rather like small birds settling down for the night. But that was in the days when they carried the highland. Oh, me, the deeds that I'd have. The deeds that I've had act and pardon, you'd scarcely believe. I like that, said Dan. After all, you told us last year, too. Only the minute you went away, you made us forget everything, said Una. Puck laughed and shook his head. I shall this year, too. I've given you size of old England. I've taken away your doubt and fear. But your memory and remembrance between whiles I'll keep where old Billy Trot kept his, high, his night lines, and that's where he could draw them up and hide them at need. Does that suit? He twinkled mischievously. Between... He twinkled mischievously. It's got to suit, said Una, and laughed. We can't magic back at you. She folded her arms and leaned against the gate. Suppose now you wanted to magic me into something. An otter, could you? <laughs> Not with those boots around your neck. I'll take them off. She threw them on the turf. Dan's followed immediately. Now, she said, less than you ever, less than ever now you've trusted me. Where there's true faith, there's no call for magic. Puck's slow smile broadened all around his face. But what have boots to do with it? said Una, perched on the gate. There's cold iron in them, said Puck, and settled beside her. Nails in the soles. I mean, it makes a difference. How? 
Can't you feel it does? You wouldn't look you wouldn't like to go back to bare feet again, same as last year, would you? Not really? No, I suppose I shouldn't. Not for always. I'm growing up, you know, said Una. But you told us last year in the long slip at the theater that you didn't mind cold iron, said Dan. I don't. But folks in Hausen, as the people of the hills call them, must be ruled by cold iron. Folk in Hausen are born on the near side of cold iron. There's iron in every man's house, isn't there? They handle cold iron every day of their lives, and their fortunes made or spoilt by cold iron in some shape or other. That's how it goes with flesh and blood, and one can't prevent it. I don't quite see. How do you mean, said Dan? It would take me some time to tell you. Oh, it's ever so long to breakfast, said Dan. We looked in the larder before we came. He unpocketed one big hunk of bread and Una another, which they shared with Puck. That's little Linden's baking, he said as his white teeth sunk in it. I know Mrs. Vincy's hand. He ate with slow sideways thrust and grind, just like old Hobden, and like Hobden, hardly dropped a crumb. The sun flashed on little Linden's windows, and the cloudless sky grew stiller and hotter in the valley. Ah, cold iron, he said at last to the impatient children. Folkenhausen, as the people of the hills say, grow careless about cold iron. They'll nail the horseshoe over the front door and forget to put it over the back. Then sometime or other the people of the hills slip in, find the cradle babe in the corner, and, oh, I know, steal it and leave a changeling, Una cried. No, said Puck firmly. All that talk of changelings is people's excuse for their own neglect. Never believe them. I'd whip them at the cart tail through three parishes if I had my way. But they don't do it now, said Una. Whip or neglect children? Hmm. Some folks in some fields never alter. But the people of the hills didn't work any changeling tricks. They tiptoe in and whisper weave round the cradle babe in the chimney corner. A fag end of a charm here, or half a spell there, like kettle singing, but when the babe's mind came to bud out afterwards, it would act differently from other people in its station. That's no advantage to manner made, so I wouldn't allow it with my folk's babes here. I told Sir Hoon so once. Who is Sir Hoon? Dan asked, and Puck turned on him with quite astonishment. Sir Hoon of Bordeaux. He succeeded King Oberon. He had been a bold knight once, but he lost on the road to Babylon a long while back. Have you ever heard how many miles to Babylon? Of course, said Dan, flushing. While well, Sir Hoon was young when that song was new. But what? But about tricks on mortal babes. I said to Sir Hoon in the fern here, on just such a morning as this, if you crave to act an influence on folk in Hausen, <clears throat> which I know is your desire, why don't you take some human cradle babe by fair dealing and bring him up among yourselves on the far side of the cold iron, as Oberon did in time past? Then you can make him a splendid fortune and send him out into the world. Time passed as time passed, said Sir Hoon. I doubt if we could do it. For one thing, the bay would have to be taken without wronging man, woman, or child. For another, he'd have to be born on the far side of cold iron, in some house where no cold iron ever stood. And for yet the third, he'd have to be kept from cold iron all his days till we'd let him find his fortune. No, it's not easy, he said, and he rode off thinking. You see, Sir Hoon had once had been a man once. I happened to attend Lou's market next Woden's Day even, and watched the slaves being sold there, same as pigs are sold at Robertsburg Market nowadays. Only the pigs have rings on their noses, and the slaves had rings about their necks. What sort of rings? said Dan. A ring of cold iron, four fingers wide, and a thumb thick, just like a quote, but with a snap to it for it to snap round the slave's neck. They used to do a big trade in slave rings at the forge here and ship them to all parts of old England, packed in oak sawdust. But as I was saying, there was a farmer out of the world who had bought a woman with a babe in her arms, and he didn't want any encumbrance to her driving his beasts home for him. Beast himself, said Una, kicking her bare heel on the gate. So he blamed the auctioneer. It's not on my baby, the wench puts in. I took it off a woman in our gang who died on terrible down yesterday. I'll take it off to the church, then, says the farmer. Mother Church will make a monk of it, and we'll step along home. It was dusk, then. He slipped down to St. Pancras Church and laid the babe at the cold chapel door. I breathed on the back of his stooping neck, and I've heard he never could be warm at any fire afterwards. I should have been surprised if he could. Then I whipped up the babe and came flying home here like a bat to his belfry. On the dewy break of morning of Thor's own day, just such a day as this, I laid the babe outside the hill here, and people flocked up and wondered at the sight. You've brought him, then? 
Sir Hoon said, staring like any mortal man. Yes, and he's brought his mouth with him, too. I said the babe was crying loud for his breakfast. What is he? says Sir Hoon when the woman folk had drawn him under to feed him. Full moon and morning star may know, I say. I don't. By what I could make out of him in the moonlight, he's without brand or blemish. I'll answer for it that he's born on the far side of cold iron, for he was born under a shaw on terrible down, and I've wronged neither man, woman, or child in taking him, for he is a son of a dead slave woman. All to the good, Robin, said Sir Hoon. He'll be less anxious to leave us. Oh, we'll give him a splendid fortune, and we shall act and influence on Folkenhausen as we have always craved. His lady came up then and drew him under to watch the babe's wonderful doings. Who was this lady? said Dan. The lady Asklermond. Askel she had been a woman once, till he she followed her horn across the fern, as we say. Babies are no special treat to me. I've watched too many of them. So I stayed on the hill. Presently I heard hammering down at the forge there. Puck pointed toward Hobden's cottage. It was too early for any workman, but it passed through my mind that the breaking day was Thor's own day. A slow northeast wind blew up and set the oaks sawing and fretting in a way I remembered, so I slipped over to see what I could see. And what did you see? A smith forging something or other out of cold iron. When it finished, he waited in his hand, his back towards us, and tossed it from him. A lonkish quote throw down the valley. I saw cold iron flash in the sun. But I couldn't quite make out where it fell. That didn't trouble me. I knew it would be found sooner or later by someone. How did you know? Dan went out. Because I knew the smith that had made it, said Puck quietly. Waylon Smith? Una suggested. See Waylon's sword and Puck of Pook's Hill. <laughs> no, I should have passed the time of day with Waylon Smith, of course. This other was different. So... Puck made a queer crescent in the air with his finger. I counted the blades of grass under my nose till the wind dropped and he had gone. He and his hammer. Was it Thor then? Una murmured under his breath. Who else? It was Thor's own day, Puck repeated the sign. I didn't tell Sir Horn or his lady what I'd seen. Borrow troubles for yourself if that's your nature, but don't lend it to your neighbors. Moreover, I might have been mistaken about the smith's work. He might have been making things for mere amusement, though it wasn't like him. Or he might have thrown away an old piece of made iron. One can never be sure. So I held my tongue and enjoyed the babe. He was a wonderful child. And the people of the hills were so set on him. They wouldn't have believed me. He took to me wonderfully. As soon as he could walk, he'd putter forth with me all about my hill here. Fern makes soft falling. He knew when day broke on earth above, for he'd thump, thump, thump like an old buck rabbit in a blurry. And I'd hear him say, Opie, till someone who knew the charm let him out. And then it would be Robin, Robin, all round Robin Hood's barn, as we say, till he'd found me. The deer, said Una, I'd like to have seen him. Yes, he was a boy, and when it came to learning his words, spells and such like, he'd sit on the hill in long shadows, worrying out bits of charms to try and pass her by. And when the bird flew to him, or the tree bowed to him for pure love's sake, like everything else on my hill, he'd shout, Robin, look, see, look, see, Robin and sputter out some spell or other that they had taught him all wrong and first till i hadn't the heart to tell him it was his own dear self and not the words that made work the wonder when he got more abreast of his words and could cast spells for sure as we say he took more and more notice of things and people in the world people of course always drew him for he was mortal all through seeing that he was free to move among folk in house and under or over cold iron I used to take him, along with me, night-walking, where he could watch folk and I could keep him from touching cold iron. That wasn't so difficult as it sounds, because there are plenty of things besides cold iron in Hausen to catch a boy's fancy. He has he was a handful, though. I shan't forget when I took him to Little Linden's, his first night under a roof, the smell of the rush lights and the bacon on the beams. They were stuffing a feather bed, too, and it was drizzling warm night. Got into his head. Before I could stop him, we were hiding in the bakehouse. He'd whipped up a storm of wildfire with flashlights and voices, which sent the folks shrieking into the garden, and a girl overset a hive there. And, of course, he didn't know till such things could touch him. He got badly stung and came home with his face looking like kidney potatoes. You can imagine how angry Sir Hone and Lady Escarmond were with poor Robin. They said that boy was never to be trusted with me night walking any more and he took about as much notice of their order as he did of the bee stings. Night after night, as soon as it was dark, I'd pick up his whistle in the fern 
wet fern, and off we'd flit together among folk into housen till break of day. He asking questions, and I answering according to my knowledge. Then we fell into mischief again. Puck shook till the gate rattled. We came across a man up Brightling, who was beating his wife with a bat in the garden. I was just going to toss the man over his own woodlump when the boy jumped the hedge and ran at him. Of course, the woman took her husband's part, and while the man beat him, the woman scratched his face. It wasn't until I danced among the cabbages, like Brightling Beacon all ablaze, that they gave up and ran indoors. The boy's fine green and gold clothes were torn all to pieces, and he had been welted in twenty places with the man's bat and scratched by the woman's nails to pieces. He looked like the Robert Spridge Hopper on a Monday morning. Robin, said he while I was trying to clean him down with a bunch of hay, I don't quite understand Fulkenhausen. I went to help the old woman, and she hit me, Robin. What else did you expect, I said. That was the one time when you might have worked one of your charms, instead of running into three times your weight. I didn't think, he says, but I caught the man on the head with what was good as any charm. Did you see it, Robin? Mind your nose, I said. Bleed it on a dock leaf, not your sleeve, for pity's sake. I knew what the Lady Eskermon would say. He didn't care. He was as happy as a gypsy with a stolen pony, and the front part of his gold coat, all blood and grass stains, looked like ancient sacrifices. Of course the people of the hill laid the blame on me. The boy could do nothing wrong in their eyes. You're bringing him up to act an influence on Folkenhausen when you're ready to let him go. I said, now he's begun to do it. Why do you cry shame on me? That's no shame. It's his nature drawing him to his kind. But we don't want him to begin that way, the Lady Eskermon said. We intend a splendid fortune for him, not your flitter-by-night hedge-jumping gypsy work. I don't blame you, Robin, said Sir Hone, but I do think you might look after the boy more closely. I've kept him away from cold iron these sixteen years, I said. You know as well as I do, the first time he touches cold iron, he'll find his own fortune in spite of everything you intend for him. You owe me something for that. Sir Hone, having been a man, was going to allow me the right of it, but the Lady Eskermon, being the mother of all mothers, over-persuaded him. We're very grateful, said Sir Hoon, but we think that just for the present you are about too much with him on the hill. Though you have said it, I said, I will give you a second chance. I did not like being called to account for my doings on my own hill. I wouldn't have stood it even then. I wouldn't have stood it even that far, except I love the boy. No, no, said Lady Eskermond. He's never any trouble when he's left to me and himself. It's your fault. You have said it, I answered. Hear me. From now on till the boy has found his fortune, whatever that may be, I vow to you all on my hill by oak and ash and thorn, and by the hammer of Asathor. Again, Puck made the curious double cut in the air, that you may leave me out of all your counts and reckonings. Then I went out. He snapped his fingers like the puff of a candle, and though they called and cried, they made nothing by it. I didn't promise not to keep an eye on the boy, though. I watched him. Close, close, close. When he found that his people had forced me to do, he gave them a piece of his mind. But they all kissed and cried round him, and being only a boy, he came over to their way of thinking. I don't blame him. And called himself unkind and ungrateful, and it all ended in fresh shows and plays and magics to distract him from Folkenhausen. Dear heart, alive, how he used to call and call on me, and I couldn't answer, even let him know that I was near. Not even once, said Una? If he was very lonely? No, he couldn't, said Dan, who had been thinking. Didn't you swear by the hammer of Thor that you wouldn't, Puck? By the hammer, was the deep, rumbled reply. Then he came back to his soft speaking voice, and the boy was lonely, and he couldn't see me any more. He began to try to learn all learning. He had good teachers. But I saw him lift his eyes from the big black books toward Folkenhausen all the time. He studied song-making. Good teachers he had, too. But he sang those songs with his back towards the hill and his face towards folk. I know. I have sat and grieved over him, grieving within a rabbit's jump of him. Then he studied the high, low, and middle magic. He had promised the Lady Eskermond he would never go near Folkenhausen, so he had to make shows and shadows for his mind to chew on. What sort of show, said Dan? Just boys' magic, as we say. I'll show you some sometime. It pleased him for a while, and it didn't hurt anyone in particular, except a few men come home late from the taverns. But I knew what it was a sign of, and I followed him like a weasel follows a rabbit. 
as good a boy as ever lived. I've seen him with Sir Hon and the Lady Eskerman stepping just as they stepped to avoid the track of cold iron in a furrow, or walking wide of some old ash top because a man had left his swoop poker spade there, and all his heart aching to go straight forward among folk and hows and all the time. Oh, a good boy, they always intended a fine fortune for him, but they could never find it in their heart to let him begin. I've heard that many warned them, but they would not be warned. So it happened as it happened. One night I saw the boy roving about here, rapping, wrapped in his flaming discontent. There was flash on flash against the clouds and rush on rush of shadows down the valley till the shaws were full of his hounds giving tongue and woodways were packed with his knights in armor, riding down into the water mists, all his own magic, of course. Behind them you could see great castles slowly lifting slow and splendid on arches of moonshine with maidens waving their hands out the windows, which all turned into roaring rivers, and then would come from the darkness of his own young heart, wiping out the whole slateful. But boy's magic doesn't trouble me, or Merlin, either, for that matter. I followed the boy as the flashes and whirling wildfire of his discontent, and oh, but I grieved for him. I grieved for him. He pounded back and forth like a bullock in a strange pastor. pasture, sometimes alone, sometimes waist-deep among his shadow hounds, sometimes leading his shadow knights on a hawk-winged horse to rescue his shadow girls. I never guessed he had such magic at his command, but it's often that way with boys. Just when the owl comes home for the second time, I saw Sir Hone and La Lady ride down my hill, where there's not much magic allowed, except mine. They were very pleased by the boy's magic, and the valley flared with it, and I heard them settling his splendid fortune when they should find it in their hearts to let him go to act and influence among folk in Housen. Sir Hone was for making him a great king somewhere or other, and the lady was for making him a marvelous wise man, wise man whom all should praise for his skill and kindness. She was very kind-hearted. Of a sudden we saw the flashes of his discontents turn back on the clouds and his shouter hounds stopped baying. There's magic, fighting magic over yonder, said Lady Eskermond, crying, reining up. Who is against him? I could have told her, but I did not count it any of my business to speak of Asa Thor's comings and goings. How did you know, said Una. A slow northeast wind blew up, sawing and fretting through the oaks, and away I remembered. The wildfire roared up one last time in one sheet and snuffed out like a fresh light, and a bucket full of stinging hail fell. We heard the boy walking in the long slip, where I first met you. Here! Oh, come here, said Lady Escarmond, and stretched out her arms in the dark. He was coming slowly, but he stumbled in the footpath, being, of course, mortal man. Why, what's this? he said to himself. Weethy heard him. Hold, lad, hold! Where cold iron? said Hor Sir Hone. And they swept down like night jars, crying as they rode. I ran at their stirrups, but it was too late. We felt that the boy had touched cold iron somewhere in the dark, for the horses of the hill shied off and whipped round, snorting. Then I judged it was time for me to show myself in my own shape, so I did. Whatever it is, I said, he has taken hold of it. Now we must find out whatever it is that has taken he has taken hold of, for that will be his fortune. Come here, Robin, the boy shouted as soon as he heard my voice. I don't know what I have hold of. It is in your hands, I called back. Tell us if it is hard and cold with jewels atop, for that will be a king's scepter. Not by a furrow long, he said, and stooped and tugged in the dark. We heard him. Has it a handle and two cutting edges? I called for that's a knight's sword. No, it hasn't, he says. It's neither plowshare, whittle hook, nor crook, nor aught I've yet seen manhandle. By this time he was scrattling in the dirt to prize it up. Whatever it is, you know who put it there, Robin, said Sir Hone to me, or you would not ask these questions. You should have told me as soon as you knew. What could you or I have done against the smith that made it and laid it for him to find, I said, and I whispered to Hone what I had seen at the forge on Thor's day, when the babe was first brought to the hill. Oh, goodbye, our dream, said her Sir Hone. It's neither scepter, sword, nor plow. Maybe yet it's a book full of learning bound with iron class. There's a chance for a splendid fortune in that sometimes. But we know we were only speaking to comfort ourselves, and the Lady Eskimond, having been a woman, said so. Thur I, Thor, help us, the boy called. It is round without end, cold iron, four fingers wide, and a thumb thick, and there is writing on the breadth of it. 
Read the writing if you have the learning, I called. The darkness had lifted by then, and the owl had set the fern again. He called back, reading the runes on the iron. Few can see further forth than when the child meets the cold iron. And there he stood in clear starlight with a new, heavy, shining slave ring round his proud neck. Is this how it goes, he asked, while the Lady Eskermon cried. That is how it goes, I said. He hadn't snatched, snapped the catch home yet, though. What fortune does it mean for him, said Sir Hone while the boy fingered the ring. You who walk under cold iron, you must tell us and teach us. Tell I can, but teach I cannot. The virtue of the ring is only that he must go among folk and house and henceforth, doing what they want done, or what he knows they need, all old England over. Never will he be his own master, nor yet ever any man's. He will get half he gives and give twice what he gets till his life's last breath, and if he lays aside his load before he draws his, that last breath, all his work will go for naught. O oh, cruel, wicked Thor, cried Lady Eskimond. Ah, look, see, all of you, the catch is still open. He hasn't locked it. He can still take it off. He can still come back. Come back! She went as near as she dared, but she could not lay hands on cold iron. The boy could have taken it off, yes. We waited to see if he would, but he put up his hands and snapped the lock home. What else could I have done? said he. Surely then you will do morning's coming and if you three have any farewells to make make them now for after sunrise cold iron must be your master so the three sat down cheek by wet cheek telling over their farewells till morning light as a good as good a boy as ever lived he was and what happened to him asked dan when morning came cold iron was master of him and his fortune and he went to work among folk in housen Presently he came across a maid like-minded with himself, and they were wedded and had bushes of children, as the saying goes. Perhaps she'll meet some of his breed this year. Thank you, said Una. But what did the poor Lady Eskermond do? What can you do when Asa Thor lays a cold iron in a lad's path? She and Sir Hone were comforted to think they had given the boy good store of learning to act and influence on Folkenhausen, for he was a good boy. Isn't it getting on for breakfast time? I'll walk with you a piece. When they were well in the center of the bone-dry fern, Dan nudged Una, who stopped and put on a boot as quickly as she could. Now, she said, you can't get any oak, ash, and thorn leaves from here, and she balanced wildly on one leg. I'm standing on cold iron. What'll you do if we don't go away? <laughs> of all mortal impudence, said Puck, as Dan, also in one boot, grabbed his sister's hand to steady himself he walked round them shaking with delight you think i can only work with a handful of dead leaves this comes of taking away your doubt and fear i'll show you a minute later they charged into old hobden at his simple breakfast of cold roast pheasant shouting that there was a wasp nest in the fern which they had nearly stepped on and asking him to come and smoke it out it's too early for wasp nests and I don't go digging in the hill, not for shillin', said the old man placidly. You've a thorn in your foot, Miss Una. Sit down and put on your t'other boot. You're too old to be capering barefoot on an empty stomach. Stay it with this chicken of mine. And I think that's enough for now. I wasn't expecting that kind of turn of events. I'm guessing you weren't either. But... Uh, there is a poem that follows, also titled Cold Iron, so I'll read you that, and then we'll leave the next section for another time. Gold is for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman, cunning at his trade. Good, said the baron, sitting in his hall, but iron, cold iron, is master of them all. So he made rebellion against the king his liege, cant before his citadel, and summoned it to siege. Nay, said the cannoneer, on the castle wall, but iron, cold iron, shall be master of you all. Woe for the baron and his knight so strong, when the cruel cannonballs laid him all along. He was taken prisoner, he was cast in thrall, and iron, cold iron, was master of it all. Yet his king spoke kindly. Oh, how kind a lord! What if I release thee now, and give thee back thy sword? Nay, said the baron, 
Mock not at my fall, for iron cold iron is master of men all. <sighs> Tears are for the craven, prayers are for the clown, halters for the silly neck that cannot keep a crown. As my loss is grievous, so my hope is small, for iron cold iron must be master of men all. Yet his king made answer, few such kings there be. Here is bread and here is wine, sit and sup with me. Eat and drink in Mary's name and whiles I do recall how iron cold iron can be master of men all. He took the wine and blessed it, he blessed and broke the bread, and with his own hands he served them, and presently he said, Look these hands they pierced with nails outside my city wall, show iron cold iron to be master of men all. Wounds are for the desperate, blows are for the strong, balm and oil for weary hearts all cut and bruised with wrong. I forgive thy treason, I redeem thy fall, for iron cold iron must be master of men all. Crowns are for the valiant, scepters for the bold, thrones and powers for mighty men who dare to take and hold. Nay, said the baron, kneeling in his hall, but iron, cold iron, is master of men all. Iron out of cavalry is master of men all. Well, you have a great day, and we'll see what we read tomorrow. Uh, it looks like the next section is entitled Gloriana. So, we'll see what happens. Have fun. Bye.